What's going on all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Near Mint Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And join me today for an overview of all of these trades from Dark Horse Comics. So, stay tuned. Now, before I go any further, I do want to give a huge thank you to the folks at Dark Horse for sending us copies of all of these trade paperbacks. Now, most of these, if not all by the time this video is released, have already been out in the book market and the direct market. So what we're looking at here is just a series of different omnibus editions, new trade paperbacks, some reprints that were previously published by different publishers, and I'll talk a little bit about that as I do the overview. And then, of course, this classic right here, the EC Archives. Now, if you want to skip around, I do put timestamps in the description of the video so you can jump around and check out the books that you've been interested in or skip any of the books that you don't want any spoilers for. So let's go ahead and start with Air. So here is Air. And I want to give a huge shout out to all my viewers that correct me because I thought this was an original graphic novel, but apparently this one had been previously published by Vertigo Comics. And now that I see that it's part of the Burger Books, it makes sense. This one retails for $19.99. And this is a really interesting premise that I didn't know where it was going. And this is the first four issues that are collected in here. Not really sure how many there are going to be, as I did not read the original series. Uh, here's a forward by G. Willow Wilson, who is the writer on the book. M.K. Perker is the artist. But what's really interesting about this is that when this was originally published, a lot of things uh, were different for air trafficking and for traveling through different airlines. So I thought that was a really interesting introduction here, talking about the world we are in today as opposed to the world we were in when she first wrote this story. And the story is pretty simple. It, it's about this air stewardess who has a fear of heights. So I was thinking, okay, that's kind of ridiculous. But if I think about it, I remember uh, when I worked in, uh, I worked at a distillery many years ago and we had to go and climb this giant ladder on the side of this uh, silo where we used to store the ash. Anyway, long story short, I worked with some guys that were afraid of heights, but had been in the military and had jumped out of airplanes within parachutes. So it made no sense. And they were like, dude, don't, don't judge me. It's just weird. But they couldn't climb up that ladder on the side of the silo. And I, it always struck me as so strange, but I guess I understand. Just because you jump out of an airplane doesn't mean you're not afraid of falling. So it makes sense, I guess, uh, in a way that she is an air stewardess. But anyway, that's not the problem here or the, the what the conflict is. Uh, the issue is that she meets this guy named Zane. So her name is Blythe, and through one of her travels, she meets this guy named Zane. And she kind of has this uh, Im immediate chemistry with that character so for the rest of the story we're following these two characters as they're kind of getting to know each other now that kind of sets up everything else that's happening because i don't want to give away exactly what this is because there are a lot of twists and turns that happen here i will say that at the point of the ending of the first chapter so this right here she gets a letter from Zane, and she's talking to her friend about how he, she hasn't heard from him in a while. And this is where the mystery kind of deepens. And she gets this letter from him, and it's from a country called Narimar. And her friend's like, I don't even know where that is. And she's like, that's the thing. That's not a real country. It doesn't exist. So what the heck is this story about? Was Zane even real? Is he from an alternate reality is there time travel this one places i wasn't expecting it to go and i've really enjoyed this i'm surprised i have not read this before um i think it came out around 2008 or so is when the series was coming out and like i said part of the vertigo line but now it's being reprinted here by dark horse comics and i liked where it was going it did take me by surprises a lot including the final issue in this collection here and speaking of this collection, this collection has 144 pages, retailing for $19.99. Let's look at the extras. So here we have the cover gallery. 
And believe me, the cover doesn't really give anything away. That's for sure. And then other burger books that are being published by Dark Horse Comics. And I want to say the paper stock in this book, this really thick paper. And I am being very vague when I explain the plot because I want people to be surprised. I don't like spoiling things on the channel. And yeah, I had a lot of fun with this one. Next up is Brilliant. Now, this is another book that was previously published by Marvel Comics during their icon phase when they had that icon imprint. And this is a part of the Bendis Jinx world, I guess, if, if you will. And because I know a lot of his stuff has been republished by Dark Horse Comics. But now he's teaming up with his Ultimate Spider-Man co-creator, Mark Bagley. But not just Mark Bagley, Joe Rubenstein is doing the inks here. And Mark and Joe Rubenstein have been working together since the 90s. Uh, so this collects the five-issue miniseries, and that's all there was of Brilliant. I don't think there was anything more. Uh, this book right here is 168 pages and retails for $19.99. And this is another take on the idea of what if superheroes were real. So it's not a world full of superheroes, but a world that is now just discovering the idea of superheroes. And it's done in the way of the movie Chronicle, if you've uh, seen that movie. Not really sure if people have, so I don't want to spoil it. But instead of it being like a UFO artifact that gives people powers, it's these five kids that are able to develop superpowers for people. And of course, there are betrayals in here. Not everybody can trust each other. And some of them are using them for good. Some of them are using them for bad. But that's basically the plot of this story. And Mark Bagley, again, supplying the artwork. And if you're familiar with his artwork, I mean, he is one of the fastest artists in comics. But a lot of his art does feel like it's the same kind of character and faces he's been drawing since the 90s. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm a huge fan of that. His artwork and people like Ron Lim. They're just super fast artists, so if they can crank out stories on a monthly basis, I'm okay with. It's not very dynamic, as some people would like, but I think it gets the job done. The part that really bugged me about this one is that it wasn't longer. I wish it was actually twice as long, and it's weird to say that about a Brian Michael Bendis story, because usually he writes stories with what some people, including myself, have called talking heads, a lot of dialogue, a lot of people just sitting around and talking. But I feel like there was something special about this one that could have been carried over into another volume. But that's all we got was just this one volume. And now it's being reprinted by Dark Horse Comics. Let's look at the extras. So the extras include a cover gallery and a variant cover gallery. And I want to say for the most part, all of this has been collected before in trade paperback and in hardcover format. Here's the script. Actually, this is not just the script, if I'm not mistaken. This is all, yeah, the actual thumbnails to pencils of some of the pages. I love when writers and artists put these kind of things in their uh, collections. It's, you know, it gives people that want to break into comics a tryout of, hey, I want to draw somebody's script. Or if you're wanting to write something, I want to check out somebody's script. Uh, but anyway, this is brilliant. Next up is The Kings of Nowhere, Volume 1. And the very first thing I want to mention about this book is the dimensions of it. It's so different than all of the other trade paperbacks. So the other trade paperbacks have the same dimensions as your standard trade paperbacks. Like here's one from Marvel. But this one here feels almost a little bit different. As you can see, it's a little bit longer right there. I'm not sure if that's... There we go. But it's also shorter than your standard size trade paperback. It almost feels like an album, but not quite. But let's go ahead and crack this one open. This one also retailing for $19.99. And this one came out late last year. I think it was around November or October, but that was in the direct market. And then the book market ended up getting it earlier this year. So this is all done by Suraush Barasesh. I believe is how you say his name. Uh, now, he does have an online moniker. He goes by Koteri Inc. Pretty cool. And what stood out to me in this particular story is the artwork. It's a very Kev Walker type of style. 
Nick Bradshaw type of style, which I guess goes all back to Arthur Adams. You know, kind of like big chins. Not like Ed McGinnis big chins, but I don't know. I, there's just something about his art that reminds me of those particular artists. And Kev Walker definitely in the detail in the faces and in the actual, like, bodies and the backgrounds so the story is pretty basic it is about this young man right here named billy who is the son of a mobster like one of the gang leaders and he's getting picked on he's picked on by all of these local thugs so he snaps one day and this intense rage and trauma drives him into transforming into his chimera form as they're known as in this world so he transforms into an ape when he gets angry and snaps so that's what he transforms and now in this world people do transform into different creatures as a matter of fact he is being trained by somebody that is helping him get revenge and that's what this is this is all a revenge story this is a story about trying to overcome this rage and not give into your animal uh, instincts if you will uh, is he able to do it? I don't know. The way this story plays out, it's rough, man. There's a lot of violence in this one. Not that Brilliant didn't have a lot of mature themes, because it did. It was mainly the uh, the actual dialogue. Air also not so much. But this one here, this one definitely has that, I would say, teen plus rating because of the violence and the language. And this one has 96 pages. There is a volume two that's coming right around the corner. I believe it's in... April. Let's look at the extras in the back, which collect the covers. I'm a big fan of his artwork. He's a phenomenal artist, and it's his first graphic novel, if I'm not mistaken. So this is the idea behind The Kings of Nowhere and how long he's been working on it. And then volume two, I think it's now April of 2023. And that is Kings of Nowhere. 40 Seconds. Now, this is one that was previously published through Comixology, so it was available digitally. And now Dark Horse is publishing it physically. So I like when they do things like that because I don't really read anything digitally. I only read things in physical format, so it makes me happy when books are brought to my attention when they come out physically. So this one's written by Jeremy Hahn, and it is drawn by Christopher Mitten, and it's called 40 Seconds. And... What I've been doing lately is I've been doing a seal of approval on one book out of a whole batch, and I'm going to be doing the same thing here. And I came really close. When I read this one, I'm like, okay, this is it. Because this kept me completely invested in the characters, in the story. And it, it lost out to another book, but I'll talk a little bit about that one here in a second. Uh, this one here, the premise is pretty simple. This is your sci-fi type of story. It's about a group of four scientists known as 1, 2, 3, and 4. They're not given names because... You have to get to know these people because you don't know what's going to end up happening. But anyway, in this particular story, they have discovered that there's alien technology and this alien technology that was given to them lets you travel through this big gate. It's like an alien jump gate, if you will. And we've seen that before, right? In Stargate was the name of the show or movie before that. But... Their story is a little bit different because they're sent in there not to just explore wherever this gate ends up taking them, but to find out what happened to the original team, the first team that went through this gate, and no one ever heard back from them. So it's a really interesting story because as soon as they go through here, you're immediately thrown into a mystery of where they are or when they are, if you will. Is it time travel? Is it really going across space? But... I really like the story. I like where it went. At the very beginning, we see one of the characters dreaming about this world. And you keep seeing 40 seconds, 40 seconds. And this, this young lady says, please help us. Now, what does that mean? So it goes in places where I didn't expect it to go, but still stuck to that very tropey sci-fi. Hey, we're traveling through this door that goes to absolutely unexplored lands that I love so much, so I'm okay with tropey things when it comes to stories like this. Uh, this one has 120 pages and retails for $19.99. And again, the more they travel through the portals, the more the mystery deepens and the more twists and turns that it goes through. 
That's why I enjoyed this one. And let's look at the extras. Okay, this is one of the few books that doesn't have any extras, but it does have the bio, not just on the writer and artist, but the colorist and the letterer. And those can be found here in the back. Next up is Bird King, volume one. So I'm hoping that means a volume two. Uh, if you've watched my channel where I talk about the upcoming collected editions for the month, this is one I've been anticipating for a while now, since last year. Uh, this book right here retails for $19.99 and it has 160 pages. And I think this is an original graphic novel. I don't think these were previously released in single issues, but by all means, if I'm wrong, let me know. I love maps. That's an understatement. Anytime a book throws in a map at no extra cost, I'm in. They could have left this blank with nothing. And, and yes, I know it's not the most luxurious map, but hell, it's very Lord of the Rings or Hobbit rather. I love this. So Bird King, what exactly is this? So what really intrigued me was, I think I put it in my top 10 for upcoming collected editions when I had no idea what it was about, just based on the cover alone. Based on that cover is what I liked about it. Had a very Studio Ghibli and Mignola kind of look to it. And sure enough, I can kind of see that in the internal pages. So we're in the world of, well, at least in this town of Feather Hill, where we meet this young girl named Bianca, who is training to be a center, I believe is what they're called. They're kind of like blacksmiths, but they're... They have special DNA built in them that can make them complete badasses when it comes to repairing swords or making weapons. So she's saying goodbye to a friend that's going off to battle. And her friend's like, yeah, I don't know if you'll ever see me again. But in here, we see a group of characters show up that were sent by a ghoul. And you get to learn a little more through here about who a ghoul is and how he came to power. And what they need from her master, who is named Thoner, Thonir, I think, maybe, that's his name, uh, is that they need him to repair their master's sword, a ghoul sword. So they go on a quest to find Orr. Now, during one of her little expeditions where she's breaking things down, she runs into the king of Feather Hill. That is this guy. Notice there's no bird yet. But yes, that is the character on the cover this isn't the exact same picture because she didn't have the hammer there as a matter of fact she's looking the opposite way and here does he have a nope no bird just a bunch of arrows on him but this is kind of where the adventure begins so it turns out that these centers are very rare so they have to respect thonir even though he hates making weapons for angle and in this particular moment, when they go and repair the sword, through this little miscommunication, if you will, look how badass they look. They find out that Bianca is also a center, meaning that she can now repair weapons and they don't need Thonir. So they immediately want to kidnap her and this sets Thonir off and him and Bianca fight off these, these group of villains that are badasses like the King's Guards. And that's kind of what sets off this story. So they, they have to escape because now they're wanted. So they go to Atlas. Now on their way, that's where the Bird King joins them. Now this is a character that is awakened by the sword. And that's all I will say. How he's related to these characters. I didn't even talk about the little horse named Hammer. Uh, how he's related to these characters and where they're going. And is he friendly or is he... Just playing them to get what he wants. One way to find out. I'm so excited about where this story is going to go. It gives you enough to want so much more. And I like that, right? It gives you enough to start caring about the characters. Start wondering what these other lands are going to look like. What a ghoul's true power is and who his other henchmen are. What more badass things can he throw at these characters? I love that about this book. So I am so hoping the second volume comes right around the corner. I know these books take a while to make. As a matter of fact, this one's 160 pages. Let's look at the back. So it's the end of Act 1, and this is the making of Bird King. And I am going to skip one page here because the little note reveals one of the spoilers of the book. So just showcasing this type of art. 
and going into the character designs. There's a lot of work that went into this, and honestly, his art looks a lot different when doing sketches than when it's finished with inks. This, by the way, is all done by, I believe, Chrome is the artist, and Daniel Friedman is the writer. And I like Chrome's bio, or what they say about Chrome in the back. Chrome, a lost prince to a forgotten throne. Nice. Any bio that starts like that, awesome. But here's some of... Oh, that's an awesome picture. Yeah, this is what the art looks like. As opposed to like the roughs and the pencils. And then you get a little bit of the script to thumbnail, to pencils, to inks, to finish artwork with the different tones of colors and then the lettering. I love this book. I This one took me by surprise, even though I was like, oh, I think I'm going to end up liking it. You know, sometimes don't judge a book by its cover. Definitely do it this time around. That's why this one gets the Near Mint Condition seal of approval. There's that graphic. Oh, this was such a joy. And I can't wait to see where Bianca and the Bird King and the other characters that are through here go on to in the next book. And now comes the part of the video where we take a look at the spines together of all the books I've been talking about. And also a small reminder to smash that like button, subscribe and ring that bell for notifications. All of that does help with our YouTube algorithm and our channel keep growing. And thank you so much to all the folks that share our videos. All right, let's keep going with the overview. All right, let's continue this with Powers. Volumes 1 and 2, these are the newly released volumes from Dark Horse Comics. And Powers, I believe, started off at DC, if I'm not mistaken, then it moved over to the Marvel Icon line. But here, let's take a look at some of the artwork and talking a little bit about the premise of Powers. It's been released in trade paperbacks, in Ultimate Editions, in oversized hardcovers, an Omnibus Edition, a, a Marvel Omnibus, the hardcover and oversized. This is the Dark Horse Omnibus. So I believe they're still being called Omnibus. I know the Grendel books are called Omnibus. Maybe they're just called Volume 1 and 2. I'll have to double check. I just double checked the power of editing. Yes, yeah, so they're just Powers Volumes 1 and 2. But let's look at Volume 1. So no Omnibus in there. I guess not to confuse people with the Marvel Powers Omnibus. So this is all by Brian Michael Bendis with artwork by Michael Avon Oming. And of course, Brian Michael Bendis, the same gentleman that did a lot of the Jinx World stories and uh, Torso uh, for uh, Dark Horse, the brilliant book that I was just talking about. And Michael Avon Oming, who has actually worked with Bendis on a few titles, including Daredevil. Now, both of these gentlemen met when they were working, I believe, at Caliber Press. That's where they also met David Mack and they became instant friends and have known each other and worked with each other for years. So the premise of Powers, which I think actually I forgot, it became a TV show. I think it's been canceled though. Is about a world where superheroes exist. So we meet the characters of Christian Walker and Dina Pilgrim. Both of them are police officers in the Chicago Homicide Department. And when they first meet, they are immediately thrown into their first case. So this is where they have to go and investigate the murder of a popular hero. That's where the first issue actually starts is with the murder of Retro Girl. And as a matter of fact, the first arc is called Who Killed Retro Girl? So here they have to go and talk to a bunch of superheroes, supervillains, and to the forensic science team, to the police officer. So it's all a CSI type of story, a law and order type of story, but done in the world of superheroes. It's a really cool premise and one that I've enjoyed. I've read these stories a few times in the past. Actually, the first volume I've read a couple of times. I haven't read a lot of the last two volumes, like the comics that will be collected in volumes three and four of this. Um, but in the first two, I've read a couple of times. My friend Chris was huge into this series. And got me into it. And I love the premise. I thought it was really cool. So this particular volume right here collects issues 1 through 11 of Powers. And you have two story arcs. You have the Who Killed Retro Girl. And you have the Role Play story in here. And Role Play is about Detective Walker and Pilgrim. 
investigating pretty much a series of murders at a college campus. So you get a little bit of that, and there's a bunch of extras in here too. A bunch of extras, including some of the script, the color, like this is the coloring book, I think is what this is called. Yeah, and there's the scripts right here. Some covers that have been previously collected by Image. Co oh, I forgot it was over at Image as well. Uh, Image and at Marvel Comics, like right there. And there are some surprising guest stars in here. As a matter of fact, there's a little bit of um, who's who back here as to who shows up in the book. And particularly in two scenes when they're doing a crime investigation. Volume 1 right here has 400 and... 64 pages now volume 2 this one here has 472 pages and both of these retail for $29.99 and like I said it's Brian Michael Bendis with Michael Avon Oming both working together this book right here collects issues 12 through 24 plus the annual of power so this is kind of like your second year and I think I think the first story arc in here, if I'm not mistaken, is called the Supergroup. And then I think the second story arc collected in here is Anarchy. So in this particular story of Supergroup, it's about Walker and Pilgrim investigating the death of one of the members of this big supergroup that's federally funded. So it's a big deal that they try to find out who Lee... So it's a big deal that they try to... So in the Supergroup story... It's about Walker and Pilgrim investigating the death of one of the members of this federally funded superhero group. And there's a lot of twists and turns in that one. Now, I haven't even mentioned, but there's also a big secret that one of the characters has in here. And when you find out why he hasn't said anything, it's kind of a big reveal. And I thought that was a really cool... I didn't, honestly, when I first read this years ago... I did not see that secret coming. Now, both of these books have a mature rating, and a lot of that has to do with the violence and the language. But, I mean, that's about it. I mean, there is some sexual content, but not, like, mature like I've seen before. But just giving a heads up to people that don't read stories like that. And the next story arc in here is called Anarchy. And this is kind of like your copycat type of story, where... There's somebody going around killing superheroes and claiming they're getting an inspiration from the killer of Retro Girl. So that's how these characters are brought into these stories. Now, let's look at the back of for the extras here. So here's some covers. And Michael Avon's uh, Oming's art style is very, very cartoony, like in the way Batman animated series. So... It's got a good mix of that Bruce Tim and Tim Cell type of art. But I know some of my viewers don't like art style like this. Like they're, they, they like to be traditionalist and like the old school art style. So I get it. But it's a really good story. I really enjoy uh, Powers. It's been a couple of years since I've read these. Oh, this is an interview back here with both Bendis and Oming. And then this is a statue of Walker. And a note from Bendis and Oming right there. And other titles from Dark Horse. Including his newer one, Joy Operations. Oh, and Pearl Volume 3 is right around the corner as well. But that is Powers, Volumes 1 and 2. And next up is Grendel, Omnibus. Now, these are Omnibus. Uh, volumes 1 and 3. Nope, Uncanny Omar, count pretty one day. Volumes 2 and 3. I've done an overview of Volume 1 in a Dark Horse overview of books that I did. I think it was in, in November, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe it was October. But this is the latest printing with additional extra pages. Uh, the books here have 544 pages and 564 pages for Volume 3. So this one here is called Legacy. By the way, if you've not read Volume 1, I don't um, suggest jumping into Volumes 2 or 3 as far as like uh, where to start reading Grendel. I think Grendel reads better in chronological order, even though you're seeing different characters because there's a whole legacy thing. And yes, I've realized that this damn book is called Legacy, but it's not about that. Uh, legacy as in 
what exactly is Grendel. And the more you dive deep into it, the more of a reward you will get. And speaking of reward, I hadn't read these in years. So these books, these two books are the reason why it took me a while to make this video. I've been reading them for over a month now. Um, not just these books, but other books in between because they're a little bit dense. Not as dense as the first one, but definitely still dense. And speaking of things I forgot about, this one here has some artwork by Tim Cell, as well as Volume 3, but there's more Tim Cell artwork in this one than in Volume 1 and 3, and it's just wonderful to see his art, and then, of course, evolve into what later would become the Tim Cell that we all know and love. But Grendo is back. So in the legacy issues, in this Devil's Legacy story, so it is split up into these four different stories. You have Devil's Child, Devil's Legacy, Devil in on the or the Devil Inside and Devil Tells. Now, these have a mature rating. And the story in here with Devil's Child, it is rough to read. There's abuse in here, and especially pertaining a child. And yeah, it's a little rough to read. So just kind of giving you a heads up in case you're like, oh my gosh, it's Tim Cell. I gotta read it. Yeah, it's dark, man. Just giving you a whole heads up. Uh, but then we get into Devil's Legacy. Now, this one's a really interesting book because it has characters that were sort of introduced in the first volume without going into spoilers. And their legacy with those characters. And who is the new Grendel? And what? why is she wearing a mask? How does she get this mask? And will their characters that appeared in Grendel be making a comeback in this particular volume? Well... Maybe, or maybe a variation of those characters could be showing up in this volume. This feels a lot different. This one has a lot more action, if you will, more than the first volume. Now, Matt Wagner does come back and do this particular collection, right? No, wait, this is the devil inside. This one is not drawn by him. He does the devil tells back here. So this is Matt Wagner actually coming back and drawing Grendel for... The Devil Tells with so many panels. That is the one negative thing I will say about these books is that as I get older, it seems like the words are just getting harder and harder to read. I have to put the book all the way back, back instead of holding it up close because, yeah, you got to wear readers now sometimes when reading books, especially books like this. So I hope one day we get here, let's look at volume three, we get some kind of collection where these stories are collected in oversized format. So then we move on to the incubation years. And again, reprinting these older stories that had previously appeared in, uh, was it uh, Comico Comics? And then eventually Dark Horse Comics, of course, when they got the rights to it. So it starts off with the incubation story. And this is all uh, drawn by Hannibal King with the exception of the fourth story. And that gives us Tim Cell back on drawing duties and they all f are focused on different times in the future they were all written by matt wagner and yeah they all take place at different times in the future because now the idea of grendo is maybe grendo is just not one person but maybe grendo is multiple people or whomever has put on the mask or whomever has come across the mask and now it becomes a different thing. Now it becomes like characters that have interacted with Grendel are now portraying Grendel or could portray Grendel. So this one gets a little deep and a little confusing because then you're like, well, well okay. While Grendel is not the nicest guy, he's done a lot of weird and questionable things, really shady things. He's not your average superhero is what I will say. He's not even an anti-hero at times. At times it feels like you're reading about the villain. This volume right here definitely solidifies the am i reading about a good guy or am i reading about somebody that thinks he's satan type of story which i guess you know mileage may vary some people might dig that and other people might be like nah this isn't for me but i kind of like the twists and turns i like that the story keeps evolving as well as the artwork because now we're i think into the early aughts if i'm not mistaken we moved on from the 90s into the early aughts. I believe there's one more volume coming out of Grendel. And oh, well, another omnibus. And then I think Space Grendel. Here, let's look at the extras, which is just the ad for the next book. 
Uh, speaking of extras, the second omnibus did have just a couple, like about the author, this, and the original cover to the omnibus. Okay, so there was a Grendel Prime in space. So there is one more omnibus, and then we had that. That's available in hardcover. I don't know if Matt Wagner has any more stories in him about the character of Grendel, or characters of Grendel, if you will. Uh, but that's Omnibus Volumes 2 and 3. Got it right that time. Almost said 1. Last but certainly not least is Shock and Suspense Stories. Or Shock Suspense Stories, rather. The EC Archives Volume 2. Collecting issues 7 through 12. This one retailing for $19.99. Now, this has been collected previously by... I Dark Horse, I think, reprinted this one. This is my original Gemstone Publishing. Yeah, this one here is the EC Archives. It was available in hardcover, but this is how I first read all of these stories. But they even included the introduction here, or rather the forward by Dean Kamen, who is the son of Jack Kamen. So let's actually look through this book right here because everything else is the same. Uh, but they are making it um, in a more affordable format. So they are in trade paperback. I don't think, at least in the foreseeable future, they're going to reprint the hardcovers. I wish they would have because there were some that I missed too. But as of now, I think they're focusing on these trade paperback versions. And, I mean, I know there's people out there like me that don't mind trade paperbacks and hardcovers. They mix and match. I mean, if you look at my collection, it's all trade paperbacks and hardcovers. So, But I also know there are people that are like, nope, I'm only buying hardcovers. I only have a certain amount of room. So I get it. And I, I respect that. But as far as Dark Horse, I don't think they're reprinting these in hardcover. So what we're looking at here is the shock and uh, shock i don't know why i've always called the shock and suspense stories maybe because it just rolls off the tongue but shock suspense stories from the 1950s i need to talk about this forward here by the way uh this i remember reading it years ago uh, when my original gemstone publishing book came out this forward by dean common who is the son of uh like i said one of the ec artists jack Hammond. it just hits so hard just how beautiful it was because he's talking about being a kid and one day his siblings go outside to play and he stays in there in the house and he goes to his dad's work table because his dad's drawing comics because that's what you did and he tells his dad dad I feel so bad for you i wish you were like all the other dads you know you, you always work you never take breaks and man, that hit me because my kids have said the same thing to me. I make YouTube videos and, you know, this is my living. This is what I do now. And I'm, it's a blessing. But his answer to his son is exactly what I told my kids. He was like, I'm going to tell you something right now, son. Don't feel sorry for me. Feel sorry for all the other dads that have to go to a place to work where they don't want to be. I get to do what I love for a living. Don't feel sorry for me because I, I get to have fun. And I thought that was such a tremendous answer. And he, and, um, he's talking about his dad. He's like, he's 84 years old during this, of course, this forward here when it was originally written, he's 84 years old and he's still working hard at his table. That's so beautiful. I loved hearing that. And that's the exact same thing I told my daughters. Well, sort of not the exact same words, but it was along those lines when, at, both of them approached me at different times. Uh, one of them here recently about how they wish I'd go back to work. They were like, I wish you'd go back to real work so you can take some time off and have vacation time. And I told them that I love doing what I do for a living. So it never feels like work, no matter how stressed I get. And I think that was so wonderful. So that one hit really hard this time around reading it. I don't think so much the first time when I read it because I was still in IT years ago. Um, but yeah, now it, it's different. Uh, so anyway, this, yeah, this stories collected from the fifties. This is, um, covers here that you're going to be like, oh, I can see why we had the seduction of the innocent, why these EC lines were canceled, because you can probably tell from the back where all the covers are collected and they feature some pretty gruesome things on the cover, including a knife being held at a woman's throat. But man, the amount 
of talent that goes into these books. These are some of the best, if not the best things you can have in your library. On my channel, I've stressed how the EC Archive line is belongs in every comic book reader's library. And not just comic book readers, they're some of the best books you're ever going to read. You have wonderful talent in here, not just Jack Kamen, but also Al Feldstein, Al Williamson, Wally Wood, Joe Orlando, Reed Crandall, just to name a few of the creators that worked on this book. There's two stories in here that, I mean, they're selling it on the cover right here. The EC's adaptation of a story by Ray Bradbury, but the stories by the other creators are better, I thought. I mean, they're not bad stories. The The stories by Ray Bradbury aren't bad, but the other stories to me are just as good, if not better. So there's a lot of good stuff in this particular volume. It dives a lot into that horror element, almost crossing the line between what is the difference between this and things like Tales from the Crypt or Haunt of Fear or Vault of Horror. Not really, because as a matter of fact, the Carry On Death here, I love this story, was adapted into the HBO Tales from the Crypt episode. Now, it plays a little bit different here because, again, it takes place in the 50s, but it's the same premise. You have a man that's running from the law and the cop won't give up. And the cop ends up handcuffing himself to this man. And the cop dies. So this man has to carry him around in this desert in order to survive and try to break himself free from this cop. Oh my gosh, I still remember this book, like, or this episode when I was a kid. And the the story that it originated from is just as gory. Now that was just one of the stories I wanted to highlight in here. The other one is this one here. Uh, this one is drawn by Wally Wood, and this one is called Ingratitude. And this gives you a small peek as to what, how life was back then in the 50s. And this deals with racism and this small town mindset and just like every other story that's collected in here there's a twist and there's always a message like a final message to the story like a moral lesson that has to be learned um you know just like all the other tales from the crypt or vault of horror or any of the frontline combat if you do bad things bad things will happen to you that one here, that I thought was ahead of its time in the way that it was handled. Now, I'm not going to give you any spoilers as to what happens in this one, but it does deal with the realities of war about two heroes coming home and how different they were. Now, I'll just say that. And it's just one of these stories that just stands out that you think to yourself, damn, comics were really ahead of their time. Now, all the way in the back is where you can find other EC archives that are coming from Dark Horse in 2022 and 2023. These are the paperback editions. Now, this book right here has 216 pages and again, retails for $19.99. If you can't find the hardcover, strongly suggest getting this one. How did I not give this a seal of approval? Maybe I was just that damn excited for Bird King. Anyway, that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing any of these books, don't forget to check out our sponsor, CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know near mint condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content and page count of each of these books. Let me know in the comments down below which you're picking up if you're interested in a particular series. If you have the Powers Omnibus and you've read it, if you're hoping that one day Dark Horse will give us some kind of hardcover collection of this particular Brian Michael Bendis stuff or all of the Bendis stuff, or if you're going to wait on some kind of hardcover, and I don't know if there is going to be one, of Grendel. To read it for the first time now if you've read some of these stories let me know in the comments down below and let me know which ones you enjoyed but that's it if you have any more questions leave them down below smash that like button on the way out everyone stay healthy and safe out there much love